Hey kids, welcome back. Want to uh, catch you up a little bit on the 1950 tow motor project we got going on here. Made some progress, made some changes, got some stuff in progress. Talk a little bit about where we're headed next and how we keep her going. Um, definitely been using it. You see over my shoulder here, milling machine. I mean, everybody said, what do you need a forklift? Well, yeah, 2,000 pounds, picked it up, moving it around. Guess what? We got a mill. So, if you're new to the channel, check out some of my other projects. We got cars, bikes, shop equipment, lots of interesting stuff, co car shows, something for everybody. How about that? But, you got to do your homework, like, subscribe, share, and as always, dare to be different. All right, here we go. Well, it looks like I got this thing all tore apart and it's not operating, but but it is. I was driving around, moving that mill, and uh, it's like, what, what the heck's going on here? Well, if you go back an episode or two, you see that there was a little dashboard here that had some gauges, or supposed to have some gauges in it. And I just stuck one in there to fill the hole. Well. You know, that's not good enough. We need to make it better. So, ta-da, look what we got here. Now, obviously, if you know old car stuff, you're going to say Smith's gauges. That's British. What the heck? And you got metric numbers in there, and those don't make sense. But, hey, it all works, and I'm going to hook them all up. I, what it should have had and what I wanted was kind of like Stuart Warner type, you know, with um, the same look, but that type of really just basic black face, white letters. Well, it turns out the electric ones like that are, are big money, and this whole operation here is is little money. So these were like 20 bucks or something, no kid from India, and I'm like, I... I would love to know, you know, temperature and, and you know, oil pressure. Uh, that's nice. Probably, probably like not a whole lot with this thing, even when it's supposed to be new. But, um, you know, just just kind of have an eye, eyeball on whether the needles are moving or not. As, uh, as you remember from previous episode, we don't have a charging system at all. We're just running off the battery. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll fix that, but um, fills the holes out nice. And we saw, you know, we're going to make um, a toggle switch adapted to this, a lighted toggle switch that was in the previous episode. Um, put that in there, and I bought a choke cable off of a company called Steiner Tractor Supply because they have forklift stuff too. And uh, I wanted one that said choke on it. I didn't want some funky symbol or anything because I wanted it to look old. And then, of course, the um, push-button starter goes here. So uh, that's going to be an improvement over... This, I believe, is the original push-button starter set up here, but we're going we're gonna to kind of tidy this wiring up a little bit. Um, this is a pretty nice little addition the previous owner made, but it's not what's supposed to have. This is just a pull switch. The original equipment had a key switch on it, but you know, I'm, I'm not worried about somebody not having a key and starting it, so we're going to put that lighted toggle switch just as a check for me so I can see did I accidentally leave it on because, eh, you know, I forget things. Sometimes you forget, right? But um, I think it looks pretty good. Yeah, I'm not going to bolt it in there or anything. But, yeah, you know, we're doing this all piecemeal here. You know, Johnny Cash style, one piece at a time. But uh, it, it came out pretty good. Um, this this little housing is kind of funny. Um, you know, nowadays, they would, I think they would have a dedicated tool to make this whole piece. And the only thing that is even close to being that is this little recession recessed area here where the choke plate the rest of this stuff was just done with the brake they look at the back side of it it's uh it's kind of booger welded here in the corner so they just cut this flat pattern out here with the the holes for the gauges and then uh you know hit it with a turret press or something to um you know 
make this little kind of angled face for the choke and then just bend it all up and welded all the corners together and then took a piece of flat metal here and ran it around the corner and welded it on three sides. So, I mean, this, besides that, if you didn't have one of these, you, you could really kind of make it on your own with, uh, with some shears and, or a, a cutoff wheel and a, and a welder. You could, you could duplicate this thing. I mean, yeah, if you get, get clever, you could probably come up with a way to make a, make a tool to, to form that. But I just thought that was pretty neat. You know, I mean, it's very unsophisticated, but hey, it works. You know, it's a, it's a forklift. It's supposed to be kind of durable. Um, you know, and the Smith's gauge thing, yeah. Um, hey, it's Smith, this is Smith Motorworks, man. I mean, I got to have Smith on here, right? So I thought that was cool. Um, it, it's centigrade or Celsius on here, but really any any gauge that you got, it's it's meant to be accurate in the middle third. So, you know, this is a 270-degree sweep here. I mean, what you're concerned with is that middle third right there. That's that's where it, it's accurate. So really, if that needle's up in that area, I don't care what the number is. It could be, you know, in Klingon or something. And as long as it's up in there, I know I'm safe. You know, it starts it starts climbing around past that. It's too hot or down here, it's not getting hot enough. Same thing with this. And this is bizarre because there's no way that's 100 bar. That I think that's this is really... Um, PSI and it's just labeled bar because 100 bar is like really really high and this thing probably has like 7 PSI at idle or something like that. I mean it's 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 probably not very high. So as long as I see it above 0, I'm I'm cool with it. But I mean the downside is is this is all electrical and I'm kind of a I don't mind a a mechanical temperature gauge, you know, with this big cable and probe that goes in here i don't mind those too much because they don't they don't cause a problem if they break they just stop working mechanical oil pressure gauge on the other hand um you know very responsive of course and um you know for a performance application that that's great but man you bust that line and you got a freaking oil fire hose pretty much uh you know ask me how i know my son's car he painted the underhood with oil uh, because the the tubing broke, so I may I may hang off on hooking that up, or if I do, I'm gonna I'll do it with some some uh, A N tubing or something because I just I don't want to have that issue with this thing. And it, the routing is kind of in a funky area. It goes like down underneath the the floorboard here, and then back up um, behind the pedals and stuff. So you know we can protect it, but even from the factory, it's it's kind of Kind of sketchy for the wiring the way it moves through there and you can see it had a an electrical gauge in in all locations from the original the the other thing is fitment i put it on here because i like the way it looked uh, the original arrangement i think was different maybe the ammeter was up on the right or something and the oil pressure was down here um i'm gonna have to jumble it all around because there's not a whole lot of clearance this is the the uh old fuel tank right here and there's not enough room to put this cable coming out up here. So it's gonna have to move down here and I'm have to move this up here. And then on top of that, the lights, which we're not gonna use. I mean, th this isn't gonna be, you're not gonna be driving this thing in the dark. Um, although I was gonna hook them up, but they stick out. You can look at it from the side, they stick out way too far. I mean, it, it can't stick out hardly at all. There's no, no room behind it. So this is, this bulb just sticks in there and there's it's just a tube. So I'm going to have to cut that down or something. It may be to where the bulb hits the face and I have to just give up on it, but I don't know. I might, I might come up with something. That's a, that's a smaller problem. I mean, this right here on the oil pressure gauge, uh, that sticks up too high too. I don't know what we'll do about that. Maybe who knows, you know, maybe I can put a you know, right angle fitting or something in there. Or we just don't hook it up. Um, but it looks better with something in the holes. When it's got the choke cable in here, which we will hook up because I hate I hate running this thing with no choke. Um, it'll start right now because it's 60 degrees here. Uh, it's not a problem. But when it starts getting cold, you know, it kind of needs a choke to get it to get it going, and um, or at least to get it warmed up a, a little quicker. And um, I want I want to have that operating. Um, you might notice. 
couple changes if you look back in an episode or two. Um, you know, I made a, a air intake hose to go into this old bath air cleaner. I'm sorry. And uh, I take, I've got it taken off of here. But um, the reason is, is because of uh, me being a me bonehead and I ran it out of fuel. And, uh, you know, this doesn't hold a whole lot. I mean, one side of this is, is uh, hydraulic fluid. One side of this is gasoline, so I don't know if it holds two and a half gallons, three gallons, or something like that. Not not a lot, but hey, that doesn't matter. You know, you run a long time. This little engine run a long time on that fuel, but well, I ran it out of fuel. All right, go get some more fuel, right? Well, I took the cap off, and it looked like uh, the surface of the moon down in there. I was like, oh, great, because the next thing I thought is. I don't remember seeing a fuel filter on this. And of course it didn't have one. And I'm like, all right, well, let's just, let's just see what we got in the fuel line here. So I, I took it loose and blew it out, but I'm like, more likely than not, whatever was in there got in this little carburetor here, this little updraft carburetor. And I'm like, I don't want to goof with this thing. Um, it says Bendix on it, but it's actually a Zenith um, design. And that goes back to like the beginning of the automobile, like, you know, 1900 or something. So pretty primitive and reliable, but probably not an information for me on getting gaskets and what to, how to adjust it. So I'm like, got my fingers crossed here. Well, I went out and uh, got some flexible line and put one of these glass clear filters in here just so I could see you know, if fuel was flowing or not, and it was flowing, it was going through. Uh, I, I got mixed feelings about those. I, you know, I think they're okay if they're not, if they're not too old. Um, but uh, we're going we're gonna to do something better because the fuel line just ran through a hole in the body or, or frame here. You know, this is kind of body and frame, same thing. It just ran right through there, just metal right through a hole. Now, maybe it had a grommet years ago that just turned to dust, but... I don't like that. I'm gonna put a bulkhead fitting in there, and we're gonna we're gonna plumb it right. You know, I, you know, I'm not restoring this. So if something really looks out of place, um, you know, that kind of bugs me. That's that's sort of why I wanted these gauges to look look old. You know, so it wouldn't immediately stand out. I know I got the LED toggle switch. Hey, that we'll deal with that. But um, I'm gonna put some you know A in line on this. I trust that stuff, and you know, it it can take the you know banging around and maybe getting a braid a braided or if that's the right word you know having contact with something else uh and not wearing through and i'll never have to worry about it again and it, and it looks cool and also um it would be period correct i mean they used uh and fittings and line in in world war ii so um it won't look too weird but the bad side of this story is i did get dirt in the carburetor and it was pouring gas out. That's why I got the line off of the air hose off here. It was pouring gas out. And I was just like, oh, man, this this is not good because I don't want to take this apart. But uh, I've, I've been goofing with cars and motorcycles and stuff for uh, a long time, uh, probably 14 years old, 15 years old. Um, and that's a lot of years, I guess. I'm not going to do the math. I was told there would be no math. So, uh I'm 50, almost 53 now, so you guys can figure that out. But the, uh, the the old trick of the guy smacking the hammer handle or the screwdriver handle on the carburetor, and wow, it springs to life because it knocked the um, um, the stuff out of the the um, um, from under the uh, needle and seat, which is what was going on with this. You know, it was it was stuck open. Um, I know it works. I've seen it work. Uh, you guys have seen it on the YouTube on uh, other guys doing it all the time, and uh, it just never worked for me until it did, and it worked on this. I couldn't believe it. I was so happy. This old thing likes me, evidently, and uh, been fine ever since. So, you know, nothing's going to get past this filter now, and whatever was in there hopefully pushed its way out through our new, you know, kind of non-stock muffler setup here that um, it's pretty quiet. We're, we're going to start it up here in a little bit because I, I realize I, you guys have never heard it run. And uh, it, it's kind of neat. I mean, it, it it isn't like hearing a, you know, Don Garlitz Hemi or something running, but it's it's still pretty fun. But 
Let's go over to the other side here and I'll show you what I did with the battery system. One of the things I don't like with my old cars or bikes or whatever is leaving them electrically charged for a long period of time. If you're going out and driving it every day, yeah, maybe it's all right. But um, I'm not I'm not so concerned about the battery running down. I'm concerned about, you know, old wiring or old repairs and there's some issue and, you know, you walk away and this is sitting here at 2.30 at night and it burns the whole place down, you know. Not only do you tear up the, the vehicle, but, you know, you might lose everything else you got. So we don't want that. Um, as you know from, from watching the previous segments in this series, uh, we don't have any kind of charging system at all. We got this, you know, what I believe is a, like a Delco 6-volt generator here. Uh, DC generator that is just completely unhooked. It, it, it may work for all I know, but this has been partially converted to 12 volt. Still got a 6 volt starter, but we got a 12 volt solenoid, 12 volt coal coil. Excuse me. Um, am I tearing up the starter? I don't know. Uh, it's ran like this for a decade, so I don't know if I can take it or not. I really got mixed feelings about continuing it, but. Um, because I, I know if I tear the starter up, I'm going to have to find somebody that rebuilds these and fix them and then tell them why I'm a moron and burned it up. But I know the um, the past dealing with uh, vehicles with 6-volt six, six systems, uh, that an 8-volt battery was used a lot of times to get them to, to turn over faster. And, um, you know, maybe that was okay. So is if 8's okay, maybe 12's okay. I don't know. But uh, that's what we got right now. We got a 12-volt battery. But I want to disconnect it. So... Um, you know, there's, there's several different kinds, you know, you got the little, you know, like NHRA type, you know, battery disconnect switch, you know, that I could put in here and turn it on and off, which is what I was going to do. Cause I, I got one in, in the, in the junk pile somewhere that, um, I don't want to use on a G, GM vehicle that I have. So, um, I, I got the, the proper one for that application and I, kept this old one that's just basically a you know on off switch and i'm like yeah okay that'd be cool and i could probably mount it on the outside but again you know that's not going to look stock so i'm like what do i do i've had the little green twist knob ones before those work but you can't just look at them and see if it's on or off i mean you got to kind of get close to it and see did i turn that knob or not is it loose um they're okay they get their place but i found this thing and it's, it's turned around here. If this battery's not mounted, that's something else we're going to do. But this thing is, um, let's see if I can get it to where you can see it. This is like Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory here with a little uh, knife and fork type switch that swings over there and makes a connection, which it's connected right now. Um, uh, I thought it was pretty cool because it looks old, man. That's, that's old tech. That's like... I don't know, Thomas Edison style stuff or something. And you can look at it and see like, oh yeah, that's not hooked up immediately. Um, it was cheap, you know, it's imported, but I like it. And I did move the battery cable around here. I think what we're going to do, no, not think, what we're going to do is flip this battery around the other way and we're going to run the positive cable around the other side of this and then the negative cable will be coming in straight because I don't like... This being so close to the side here because if this slid which because it's not mounted right now yeah you know it's it's going to make a connection off the the body here that and i think it just looks better i can read the the stuff on the battery and i don't know the original battery was probably about the same depth but probably 50 percent longer because you can see where the space is and the holes so we'll make there's some still some holes mounting holes down in there there's a big stud sticking up there let me see that blocking with my hand but it's it's right there you see the threads on it in the shadows maybe yeah there it is but yeah that's part of the battery hold down we'll make a tray or hold down or something and get it in here right um you know we're not burning around the autocross course or something with this but i don't want the battery moving so we're going to fix that that's on the plan the other thing that's on the plan is uh the shifter here that we 3D printed some knobs for. I talked about copied the copied the factory control knobs here, which is what what this should have up here. But the um, uh, forward and reverse, and then the the high and low range in this made some knobs for this. But uh, 
I know you probably can't see this, but you can definitely hear it. That's that's how much play this thing has in it. So um, it's not going in forward or reverse. It's just that sloppy. But down at the base here, there's um yeah I think you can see that moving. Yeah, there there was evidently a bushing in there, or there will be. Um, and it's it's just you know dancing around in there like a snake in a hot or a hot snake in a hot oven you know so uh, we we can't have that we want to we want to tighten it up um, but hey it's a 1950 it's years of being moved back and forth you, you got to expect that so we're gonna work on that I I got the floor boards out the the side floor boards are just sitting in here because um, I painted them and uh, I got this one out just because it's hard to put in and out and I'm just lazy at this point i want it well actually i'm not lazy but i i wanted to move the mill over here and i'm like i'm not fishing that thing in there and i want to try to color sand that because i got some i got some flaws in in that floor pan and i want floor plate and i want to clean it up a little bit and um also for these these aren't bolted in and they got you know, muddy boot, boot prints on them because they have a bolt that goes through them and there's a nut on the back side, and you got to stick your hand through this little access slot. And that I hate that, man. I'm, I'm going to make a plate with nuts welded to it, and uh, we'll just rivet it to the body here. And uh, then, so we'll have, you know, threads that, that stay in place there, and we can just get it all from the top side. And, and take it out. So that's that's on the list of stuff to do. Um, started getting a lot of wine from the hydraulics the last time I used it. And uh, I looked in here and I was like, oh boy, yeah, this is way low. Uh, I knew it leaked a little bit. And I think it had been leaking and leaking and hadn't been checked in a long time. Because, hey, it worked. Why check it? You know, but um, I put a gallon of hydraulic fluid in here. And it took me a little bit of research to find out what to put in here. And I just didn't want to guess. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, on the internet with expert opinions. And but I was like, I, I just, you know, I don't want to tear this up, man. You know, I, I put the wrong thing in here and it dissolves a seal or something. I may never be able to get it fixed again. But um, it does have a tag here, and it probably is not going to show up. But yeah, it is uh, like the third line there. It says use good grade motor oil, which I guess that's kind of subjective, but. SAE number 10. I'm like, what is SAE number 10? That's not, you know, not something that you just go and go grab. I'm like, well, I'm not going to assume that's motor oil. Well, SAE number 10 was supplanted by a, I think it's AW32 maybe, but it's, there's like a 32 and a 40 for hydraulic oil. And that's the, the ISO numbers, you know, or, or metric if you want to use that. So, that's the equivalent, um, the, the viscosity from 30 and 42. And I, I, I hope I got the numbers right. Uh, you know, the higher number is, is thicker. And a lot of people said, I'll run that. But I'm like, ah, I don't know. You know, because it's old and they're thinking, yeah, you know, just like an old car, they're thinking thicker oil, you know, it's not going to leak as much. Um, I didn't want to do that. So I put the I put the 32 in it that's supposed to have and uh did fine it took a whole gallon and i think it's still low but um you know definitely started looking at where the leak is at and it's the tilt cylinder on this side here and i got a little pan underneath there to catch it, it it's not bad i mean um old mechanic told me you know I'd rather have them leak than burn it which i know you're not talking about the engine here but um at least you know where it's going when it's leaking was his thought which is yeah, hard to argue with that logic but um we may tear into that and uh, see if I can get it uh, resealed or buy the seals or something. Uh, there's a place right down the street. There's a lot of kind of race industries in, in my little town, uh, Brownsburg, Indiana, and uh, guys that do hydraulic stuff. So um, I may take that apart, take it down there, and see if it doesn't break the bank and get that get that going. But uh, that's, that's some of the things we got on the go. Um like I say, definitely been using it. I'm, I'm still got to, got to get to this. This is, this is kind of bugging me, and I, I'm not sure what's going on here. It's supposed to be a bolt-on affair, and it's welded and bolted, and it has extra bolts. And but I, I want to get this out and try to, you know, 
just bang some of the the dents out of this and, and get it painted to where it looks you know a little closer to what we did with the side plates and the um, the dash panel here so you know again piece at a time making it look a little bit better but hey we're using it at uh, it still runs like a top and that's coming up next compression so it's kind of wheezy um, and it's probably worn out a little bit too looks like if you notice that muffler was moving a little bit there maybe I don't got that tight enough or I gotta put a spacer in there but it's it's a lot quieter than it was and it's still pretty quiet um, it's louder right now because I got the seat off of this so you can see the engine but when you're on this thing I mean you you hear the hydraulics working more than you hear this little engine running um, you know old tech for sure definitely um back in the dark here you don't want to put your hand back too far big old fan blade spinning back there you put you put five in you come out with um not being able to count to 10 anymore so um you know but who's going to do that right hopefully not me but wanted you hear it run and uh check out some uh 1920-ish engine technology that uh still going strong into the into the 60s in a lot of stuff even even in cars my uh my 60 studebaker truck had a flathead six cylinder very very similar to this just kind of scaled up so cool stuff how about that one guys we're gonna keep working on this old thing and get the uh little van going behind me um you know we kind of Kind of got the shop in a shambles here, you know, placing this mill back here. Um, I got plenty of room in here, but I I got everything on the floor, so we're gonna we're gonna get it up and out of the way to work and work on some of the other projects and some of the other cool stuff in the back, like my Corvair and my Studebaker pickup truck and my '68 Camaro and my my old Cutlass is behind this. Um, you know, got a lot to talk about and work on and and check out and just generally dare to be different. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, definitely tune in next time on Smith Motorworks. Dare to be different. Later. <laughs>